Hello folks, my name is Dr. Zachary Hildenbrand. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Kevin Shug, and we are the Collaborative Laboratories for Environmental Analysis and Remediation at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're coming to you from the uh, Responsible Shale Energy Extraction Conference, which is a very unique event, bringing together scientists, concerned citizens, operators, regulators, and technology companies to have an honest series of conversations about environmental stewardship in shale energy. We'd really like to thank the support of the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation and Earth Day Texas for allowing us to put on this event. Uh, we believe that this content that we're going to be providing to those who haven't been able to attend is going to help answer and educate a lot of questions surrounding responsible shale energy extraction. So we hope you enjoy the content. Uh, hi, so I'm David Hahn. I'm a reporter at the Houston Chronicle and uh, I'm moderating a panel on Alpine High down uh, the Apache's West Texas find. Um, you know, about September, I think, I got September a notice, 2016. I got, a, I got a, an email in, in, in my inbox that said that Apache had found uh, 3 billion barrels of oil and 75 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It was one of the largest finds um, of the decade, if not far more than that. Um, and it was a really interesting find for many reasons. One, because it was so large, it immediately brought, uh, frankly, skepticism from your competitors. Uh, and it also is in a very interesting place. Um, I, I, I don't know if you, raise your hand if you've been to Balmeray. So I'm not a Texan, I'm new here. And Balmeray is one of the most beloved places I've, I mean, it's just incredible the, the outpouring of emails and phone calls I got after writing that first Alpine High story. So uh, unlike so many uh, oil and gas discoveries that are in the middle of nowhere or far from the eye, um, Alpine High, it surrounds this little town of Balmeray and its famous San Solomon Springs, which are the, you know, the, the springs that bubble out of the ground and fill this pool that kids in Texas have been swimming in for decades. And uh, it's, it's really a, 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 you know, a wonderful place. And so immediately, you've, you had this massive find and at the same time, uh, incredible concern over um, the development of oil and gas and also the, um, you know, the, the impact on the, on the community in, in, in every way. So we're gonna, we're gonna tackle that impact um, as, in a straightforward way as, as well as we can. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the impact on the, on the water. We're gonna talk about the use of water. We're gonna talk about the, um, fragility of the water system out there, and we're gonna talk about the impact on the skies, um, because all of that development, not just in Alpine High, but across the Permian Basin in West Texas, is, uh, is change, literally changing the night skies. And so uh, we've got, again, a very impressive group. Um, Zach Hildenbrand is a researcher who has studied water contamination issues across the country. He's with CLEAR at UT Arlington and runs his own company in form environmental. Uh, Sabrina Habib is a professor at Winthrop University in South Carolina, and she studies um, a, a facet, so she studies how communities are affected by uh, oil and gas development, but also how they perceive that um, development and how they perceive that they're affected. Well, is that fair? Sabrina? That is fair. Okay, good. Bill Wren, in the middle, uh, is uh, at the McDonald Observatory, which is uh, in the Davis Mountains, just south of Belmaray. And uh, Bill is literally the spokesman for dark skies in West, West Texas. There is no person you will see more in the paper on this subject than Bill Wren. Next to Bill, Marcus Bruton, Manager of Health and Safety and Environment for Apache, all of Apache, Alpine High. The, the North American Unconventional Resource okay. Team, for, which, which North American Unconventional Resource, Resource right. And then uh, next to Marcus is Brian Baum. Brian is a hydrogeologist that Apache hired specifically to study and manage water issues in Alpine High. Uh, so let's start with this. Um, maybe Zach, you could start us off sure. with a. Balmeray is, high, you know, in terms of water, is a fascinating place. Can you just yes. give us a primer? Why is the water issues? Why is water such an important part of Belmaray? 
Okay, uh, so basically I would uh, characterize the San Solomon Springs, the pool out there, the Balmeray State Park, I think it's much akin to uh, Chichen Itza in Mexico, uh, Machu Picchu in Peru. I mean, it's this beautiful natural wonder. Um, we are actually just out there collecting samples earlier this week, and it's like swimming in an aquarium. I've never seen anything like it. And so that's where the concern lies, is you have this natural beauty, the jewel of West Texas, and folks are concerned about uh, any industrial process coming in there and having a negative impact um, on that ecosystem. You also have several endangered species of fish. Uh, I, I'm not a, a biologist, but I, I believe there are several species of, of pupfish. Um, and there's a, the Native American culture there believe that, you know, that land is sacred. It has a tremendous amount of significance. Um, so when you consider all these factors, there is a tremendous impetus for us to, uh, if we are going to explore for oil and natural gas out there, that we need to do it responsibly and we need to monitor the process every step of the way. And uh, what I can say is having gone out and collected 550 samples here in the Barnett Shale, going down to South Texas in the Eagle Ford, Haynesville Shale, going up to the Marcellus and collecting water, you know, below freezing. Um, Single-handedly, the work that we've done in Balmeray, uh, while extremely rewarding, has been the most challenging. I mean, it's the most contentious. Everyone is very, very concerned over there. It, it's a highly polarizing issue, and uh, there's a lot of, a lot of scrutiny. So, uh, that means that when not only do we have to go out there and collect a lot of good data and interpret it, but we have to do a lot of community service in the sense of educating folks out there as to what this testing is doing. Um, it's no secret now, you know, we're collaborating with Apache, which we believe is an incredibly responsible operator for a number of reasons. Uh, they sought us out to collaborate with us. Um, they've been very forthcoming with chemical disclosures, so, which is... Zach, pause there for a second, because that's a really interesting moment. Okay. Because the, 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 this was not something that, like, the two groups got together and said, hey, we need to study water. This was, uh, you, you wanted to study water, you saw it as a moment that was very unique because so little oil and gas development had happened. Yeah, so um, how it all came about is uh, I was asked by my good friend and colleague, uh, Sister Elizabeth Reeveschlager, who I uh, have a tremendous amount of respect. She's the queen bee of the Eagle Ford Shale. Um, she said there are concerned citizens out there in um, West Texas, in Balmeray, um, would you mind coming out and giving a presentation? Gave a presentation to the school board, to the town hall, talked about our research all across the state of Texas, and uh, at that point we were trying to raise money through crowdfunding, we were trying to raise about $55,000 to do this work for a one year monitoring program, um, you know, before activity really picks up out there and uh, didn't have much success. We worked really, really hard and, and people just didn't have the resources to finance it. And we were approached by Apache um, where they you know, said, can we sit down and talk about some of your latest research? And they said, we obviously have taken note of what you're trying to do out there in West Texas. Uh, how can we help? And uh, that was unprecedented for us um, because we've done this research all across the United States and as I mentioned this earlier this morning, you know, we do not get very many Christmas cards in the mail. Um, I get more death threats than I get Christmas cards, I can, I can assure you of that. And so for them to come to us, want to work and to share uh, their chemical disclosure and to allow us to work autonomously while also opening up opportunities for us to sample wells around there, it was uh, an unprecedented opportunity. So I, I want you to talk at some point soon about the troubles you're having. Sure. But I want to drag Brian into this first. <laughs> sure. So Brian, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, so the, the, the aquifers in, in that area are, I don't, is unique the right word? Well, uh, unique is a relative term. Um, it's not the only karst aquifer. T tell us, in define Texas. karst. So karst, karst generally implies that there's a limestone or dolomite rock that's the basis of the, the aquifer, um, and that there's faulting, fractures, cracks, crevices, potentially caves um, that groundwater flows through, whereas in a typical porous aquifer of sandstone, water flows around individual grains of sand. Well, you've, in a karst, you can have open pipe conduits. For instance, if you see, there's photos of Phantom Lake Spring Cave where there's a 30 plus foot conduit where water flows through it. So it's a 30 foot wide pipe where there's scuba divers. Brian, around. I said to George Vini, the researcher uh, from New Mexico, I said, uh, is that like a, 
cave underground with a river running through it. And he was like, that's stupid. If it's, if it's, you can't say a cave underground. Caves are always underground. But that's still what I think of. It's a cave underground with a river running through it. Sure. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 30 like, foot pipe of, it's a 30 foot pipe of water that flows to the ground. Is all cars 30 foot pipes? No. Is, you know, is, is, is all of Balmeray area that 30 foot pipe? No. But, but it's part of it. You know, there's sinkholes, there's, you know, the, 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 the key difference between a karst aquifer and, and a sandstone aquifer relates to the ability of water to flow at speed. You know, so speaking of Dr. Venny, Dr. Venny did die trace from Phantom Spring to San Solomon Spring. It's approximately six kilometers in distance. It took six days. So that water is literally moving a kilometer a day through there. Usually when we talk about groundwater flow, we're talking about sub-centimeters per second or, or day, you know, where it's a very slow process. So for that, that's a big concern. You know, there's the, the potential impact associated with water moving that fast. Um, you know, that's one of the other reasons, speaking of Dr. Venny, if he had his way, he stated that he would never have development on the north side of San Antonio because, again, it's, the, it's another karst environment. It's what recharges the Edwards aquifer and it's similar you know there's potential concerns so it's it's that dynamic environment that's so the, of concern yeah and, and this this system of aquifers you know some of them are cars some aren't but this system of aquifers both allows for the San Solomon Springs I mean it literally creates the pool and at the same time is a headache for oil and gas companies well, uh, it's not a headache it's, it's 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 part of the environment it's something that we have to understand which is a part of the reason why Apache hired me. I'm a karst hydrogeologist, um, so that we understand what the risk is of operation in that act, or act, operational activity in that area, and how we can best mitigate risk and manage it. You know, so one of the things that we're doing right now is we've contracted with Dr. Vinny. We're currently trying to finalize a contract with the University of Texas Austin, uh, the Jackson School of Geosciences, and BEG to to do some additional research. These these are researchers that have been researching this system for 30 plus years, but really the last significant data discovery was around 2000. What do you, what do you want to find? What do you need to know? Well, well we're, we're just trying to understand how, where, where does the water that recharges it and discharges the spring come from? How does it flow through there? Um, you know, is it, I mean, the general consensus right now is it's kind of right along the Reese County, Jeff Davies state line, um, you know, it's a big regional flow system that provides the majority of this flow at the spring. I mean, San Solomon Spring flows 30 cubic feet a second all day, nearly every day. And it's, it's, it's a dry desert climate, so you know that it's not local rainfall that's recharging that system. So that's what we're trying to do is understand where that water flows through, and if we understand how that water comes and feeds those springs, that, as an operator, allows us to understand where we can operate, where we can't probably not operate, or where we have to have additional mitigations and, and, and best management practices to try to make sure that we don't impact those springs. Yeah, so we're at some advanced, to add to what Brian had to say, we're at some advanced stages of some si shallow seismic uh, work in the area to help us even take the identification of these subterranean caverns to another level. Marcus, what does that mean, shallow seismic? Uh, well, basically, when you go out and you shoot the seismic for the geologist, it, it goes down deep to try to um, um, model hydrocarbons many thousand feet below. And what is typically up to, close to the surface of the Earth's crust is, is not really that important in, in time, So, because that's not where the hydrocarbon resides. But we are trying to work with, with Dawson Geophysical to try to uh, develop a system, and again, in the advanced stages of that, to try to use that to identify those caverns. So I want to come back to this point in a second, but I want to skip to Sabrina first. But the point that I want to come back to is you don't want to drill through karst aquifers, right? If you can help it, you avoid them? You're always going to drill through karst. I mean, the, the, the limestone's present throughout there. You don't want to drill through a cave. The cave, obviously. that's what I mean. Um, you know, you drill through a cave, you lose circulation, you have potential you know, pipe drops. It's, it's, those are the things, obviously, we don't want to drill through. Okay, hold, we, hold that thought for a second. Sure. Okay. So, Sabrina, what's the reaction in town? Like, what do people think about, not just Alpine High, but what is their worry about water? Okay, so uh, in January, there are some activists that have, uh, from Dakota Access, that have joined local activists there that are opposing this. 
And um, the majority of my research was done um, here in this area, in the Bernay Shale, not in the Alpine High, but um, and some of the Marcellus Shale as well. But I think that there's a consensus in how uh, people perceive the industry um, that applies to Alpine High very just as well. Um, and before I get into that, I just want to say that I'm really glad that Apache had, has reached out to CLEAR and that this unprecedented um, collaboration between industry and science, especially because um, it lets uh, us be transparent with the public. Um, I think this is a, a huge first step in eliminating the problems that I'm going to list. But basically, we're looking at an industry that has a really poor track record of environmental stewardship. We are looking at all of the health risks that were highlighted this morning. Um, we are looking at uh, lower quality of air, potential water contamination, and the residents there, would, aside from protecting the beautiful spring, um, they don't want an industrial process in their backyard, behind schools, behind where the parks where their kids play, behind their homes. And, that's very understandable because this industrial process is extremely complex. It's very hard to understand. One of the studies that I did to see how media portrayed, um, I'll call it fracking or hydraulic fracturing, uh, how they portrayed this process, it's largely- Damn media. Huh? I said that yeah. damn media. Yeah. Um, I, I like the media <laughs> very much. Um, but it is portrayed mainly as a water problem. And that's because it is so hard to portray it as everything that it is. Yeah. Soil, air, seismic activity. I, I love what you said there about the impact on the community itself. Because I think one thing we forget about a lot is that, you know, it's going to change Balmeray. And, and I think it's understandable for residents to be worried about just, you know, like, this is a, I'm, you know, I talk to people from Balmeray with some frequency that some moved there to get away from the city. The last thing they want to see is, like, an industrial process in their backyard. Absolutely. I just think that's a great point. It's Absolutely. And most of these people, they either want to protect their retirement because they want a pristine, clean, natural place. They want to protect their children. I certainly wouldn't want that in my backyard or where my kids go to school or where they play as a parent. Um, I... Our instincts is to protect them, and we know that are, that there are risks. Um, now, when we talk about risk, we have to understand there's perceived risk and there's actual risk. Um, because the actual risk has to date not been communicated to the public um, in a way that in a way that's clear. No pun intended here. <laughs> Um, in a way that, that's uh, clear, there's, there's confusion about the process, there's confusion as to how, how when the, the, the contaminations happen, is it affecting me, how is it affecting me but not my neighbor, there are lots of questions and so because there are many more questions than answer because of the track record of the industry uh, that has not been good so far, um, the perceived risk might be much higher than the actual risk. But what that happens then is a lot of stress, a lot of fear. PTSD is something that I have seen, you have seen. Um, so mental health issues uh, become very real with the perceived risk, despite if, even if the real risk is low. Um, talk about the track record of the industry in 2012, our uh, Secretary of State, uh, Rex Tillerson, he was the CEO of Ex Exxon at the time. Um, while Exxon was fracking all over the place, uh, he sued a company that wanted to do it in his area, in his county. Uh, the, that lawsuit was dropped uh, when it got so much public attention. But how do you think the public well, perceives... Exxon probably wasn't fracking in 2012, right? Some other, other companies were. Right? XTO. Yeah, yeah XTO. but associated, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, but, but the perception of the public, it, even if they weren't, so here we are, big oil, let's say, um, doing, the, doing it in my backyard, but they don't want it in theirs. And it didn't happen there. So his water was protected, his so that's property a, was protected. That's a really interesting point, too, because I think that there is a, there's a social element to this that we sometimes forget, which is that um, you know, communities with money have more ability to protect themselves from whatever. It doesn't matter, right? You name it. There's, There's no uh, 
There's absolutely there's power no, in play. You know, there's no uh, trash dump in River Oaks in Houston, right? And there's reasons for that. Now, let, let's jump here for a second to Marcus. Um, I did want to add one thing. It, yeah. it, absolutely, the, the track record of the industry is, as you said, that there would be no disagreement from our side. Um, that's where we want to set ourselves apart as Apache Corporation. We do understand that the, that the eyes of, of, of the nation are upon us as we go into this area. Absolutely, it's pristine. We want to handle ourselves responsibly. That's why you'll see some, some things that, that may not be typical of the industry that we've been able to do, uh, such as partnering up with, uh, with UT Austin and Mr. Hildebrand, and, um, and then our communication with, with Dr. Wren as well. Marcus, um, talk too about your approach in the community and things that you've done. I know they don't all work. Sure. And I know residents in some cases want more, but tell us about going into the community and how you've dealt with that. Sure. You know, w one thing about it is we try to be very transparent and open. Uh, soon after the announcement of the Alpine High, we went um, and um, certain Apache officials met with, uh, with leaders at the, at the city. Uh, then we arranged a, a, a town hall meeting there where we were able to, uh, to collaborate with, uh, with some of the folks there, answer some of their questions, Talk, look at them in the eye. Because uh, myself, being from West Texas, I, I certainly want to go out and, and look the people in the eye and, and have an understanding of what their concerns are. Um, in many ways, our roles are, are not much different. We're just on, on two different sides going toward the same, um, same goal and objective uh, and trying to set ourselves apart. Then, then when you do get uh, the occasional concern or media inquiry, guarantee you those things are taken very seriously many many questions come to me and we we work through different departments to make sure those questions are answered and we want to um, if, if issues do come up where we need to go and investigate take a look at things we certainly do that no matter how they're how emotionally they may be communicated we try to look through that to the root of, of what's been communicated it, to it, us that gives me um, a lot of hope that that this can be an example set to yes. the rest of the industry I love that. and and that's why i opened with uh, my appreciation for this Certainly. collaboration um, i i think that you guys are definitely taking a step in the right direction uh, but my research comes from you know the long Absolutely. history of this industry Absolutely. and and this long history is actually going to be a bit of a barrier that you have to overcome because for you to gain trust um, is it, going to be tough because there isn't there isn't much of that going on at the moment. Jump to Brian. Yes, there's so there's there's always going to be a degree of secrecy within the industry, mm -hmm. and that's and that this goes back to some of what Marcus was talking about with the seismic. I mean, there's there's. So our seismic data that we've collected is one of our biggest assets and one of our biggest competitive advantages. You're not going to see us publishing that data. It, it, it's what drives our business. That said, though, the research that I'm doing on the water side, the research Clear is doing, in addition to Clear, we also have other water sampling, soil sampling, and air sampling that's being conducted by CH2M. That's all going to be published. We're, we're, we're not holding this data back. Brian, how are you going to do that? How do you publish that stuff? You put it online? or Our goal on all of it is going to be peer review journal. We want it to go through the scientific scrutiny that anybody else does. Uh, soil stuff and air stuff too? Absolutely. So, so we're working with CH2M right now. They're going to start publishing hopefully soon. Um, you know, we've talked to Dr. Shig about possibly just co-authoring some things um, with the CLEAR program on the water side at least. Um, so yeah, it's all going to come forward. Um, the work that I'm doing and the contracts that I'm working with with Dr. Venny at, at the National Cave and Karst Research Institute and the stuff that I'm doing at UT and BEG is all going to be publicly available. It's going to be published. It's, it's, we're doing the science for the benefit of the community as well as for the benefit of, of the company. You know, I mean, in addition to what we're talking about here, we're also trying to, you know, when we source fresh, or when, I guess, I shouldn't say fresh, when we source water, for our completions operations, we're going for non-fresh, non-boilable options. We're trying to develop... And you're digging your own, right? You're drilling your own wells to find... To the extent that we can. I mean, there's, there's restrictions to that. We've got landowners that want us to buy water from them. You I know, think, so there's... Brian, another fair concern is, that, is the use, Apache's use of... I don't, it's not municipal water, but for lack of a better term, you know, the public water supply. You want to talk about that a little so we're, bit? So right now, everything that we're doing... Uh, in the past, we have used water that came through the public supply system. Um, we are currently not doing that. Our goal is to sole source all of our water that we can 
reuse what we can, obviously, on our produced water side. And then we're tapping the rustler, which is a deeper, non-potable aquifer in the area. Um, and the idea is that by developing that resource within the company, we also provide a potential resource for the landowners once we're no longer there. And in the meantime, we're providing data that the landowners themselves or the community, you know, the groundwater conservation district that's recently been formed, all have this information that they can use. All right, let's jump to Zach for a second. Yeah, and I'd just like to finish on that um, particular note. Uh, it's, it's really important to note that, you know, our appreciation for this partnership with Apache and how they're operating, you know, this is not a fluff piece. We're just speaking from experience. Well, hold on, pause for a second. The reason that's so important is because you've never, like, it's very rare to do what? To have the... It's very rare. I mean, what I was going to say is we have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have seen how some oil and gas companies treat people where their water is pristine and then all of a sudden it lights on fire and how they've been treated and put through the ringer. We've seen people that their air quality has been compromised by a well blowout in the Eagle Ford and how they're treating those folks. It's, it's disgraceful. And so this is the exact antithesis from our perspective, and so that needs to be applauded, and we hope that that will serve as a litmus test for the rest of industry. Um, as far as difficulties in Balmeray, um, this is difficult for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, you're out there in far rural Texas, the hinterlands, um, if you will. Uh, road conditions are tricky. Uh, I, I blow tires like it's my job um, on my tundra. Um, every single trip, I blow a tire. Um, so there's that. Um, and again, you've got the, the, the sacred nature of the land. You've got the concerns that people have. You have people that are concerned that our independent investigation is going to get in the way of their, their financial benefit. They think that our research is going to shut down all the activity and, and we're going to spoil the party. Yeah, Zach, talk about that for a second because you've gotten a fair amount of kind of like, you know. We, again, we, your, we your get Your study it, is not always um, well... Uh, you know, yeah, no, we, again, now I try to, the saying that Kevin and I always use, we, we try to play good cop, Canadian cop, so we try to be as nice as we possibly can, and still, I have people saying, I can't believe that you're doing this, you need to help us protect the, the sacred nature of this, this uh, place by banning fracking, and then the other side is, your research is trying to put a black eye in industry and it's really going to affect my children, you know, me being able to pay for my kids going to school. So we get it from both sides. And some and have actually pulled out of the study because of it. Yes, yeah, we, ha we have had... Not a lot though, right? No, no, uh, we've had people that have been very difficult and, I, and this last trip that I did go there, you know, I show up and they ask me the 30 questions, okay, what are you, what are you looking for? What are these analyses? What, what are those bottles you're using? Why are you wearing gloves? Uh, who funded this research? And then it's like, okay, well, we're, we're collaborating with Apache here. And they go, okay, well, uh, whoever puts the money up for this research, then they have full control over the data, and they'll just squash this if you find anything. And I said, no, the beauty of this is they donated these funds, and they have given us full autonomy. So irrespective of what we find, we're going to publish that information. There is not going to be uh, any censorship here. It's an ideal situation. Zach, do you rely on them for future funding? We would love to continue this partnership into the future, no doubt. I mean, the Alpine High is going to be going on for decades. They're going to be drilling thousands of wells out there, and that doesn't happen overnight. Um, I think that, you know, they're just getting started out there, and we would love to work with them uh, into perpetuity to make sure that we're doing this responsibly. So, okay, this is maybe a tough question, but what happens? I mean, you know, Apache has promised they will not mess with their study. I understand that, and I have no reason not to believe them. Yeah. But for people who are skeptics, how do you, like, what happens if Apache comes and says something different to you? What do you do? What if they do want to mess with your study? Okay, Sorry, guys. Hypoth you know. hypothetically, if we had an industry partner that said, uh, you know, let's say we find thermogenic gas in the water that wasn't there previously, and we can do uh, the molecular tracing and fingerprinting back to a particular well, and they say, no, that's hogwash, that's not possible, that study would, we would no longer work with that partner. So you would just pull out of the study and probably tell everyone, right? We would publish the research. Okay. Um, but we would no longer be taking funding from that entity. And uh, again, there's, there's a war on science we're at currently. Um, and people don't like scientists. They don't like research that doesn't uh, support their hypothesis. And so from our perspective, all we have is our integrity. And without our integrity, then this is, research isn't even worth doing. And we work extremely hard. We've made a lot of personal sacrifices to do this research, and it's been a blessing to finally find people 
that want to work with us and have the same values. I mean, speaking from experience, I can give you one example where we're doing work in, in the Eagle Ford Shale. Uh, we have full permission to be on the, the land, obviously the landowner, who is a mineral rights owner, funded the research. And we're doing the, the work. We've seen the, the lease saying that, that the landowner can permit people to be on the pad sites for scientific testing. And then I get a call from Oklahoma City saying, you are not allowed on these pad sites. And I said, well, actually, we've seen the lease. And he said, no, nope, anytime I see you on those pad sites, we are arresting you. So do not go on those pad sites. So obviously, that's not a very collaborative message that they're giving. And we even provided our data to that, uh, that operator and uh, said, we, would, we found some things I think you could improve upon and heard nothing. That is irresponsible shale energy extraction. And that's not what, I, what we're seeing here um, okay. with Apache. I'm just speaking from experience. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm feeling under the gun to get to uh, dark skies. Um, but I really quickly want to ask a few questions. Let's keep answers short, because they're very good questions. Um, one of the concerns of people is that the research shows water. If the research shows water contamination, that info will be confined to clear and Apache until peer reviewed and published. Will the person who whose water, stud, water is found contaminated yes. be told? Yes, absolutely. Um, we need to be transparent with those folks as, as well. And uh, you know, again, we were just out there for our second round of testing and uh, we provided all the, the well owners uh, with that information. I answered all their question. What, Zach, Zach, what is a strontium? Well, you know, it's a metal ion. I, I, so we go through the whole thing. And uh, what's difficult in, in the Alpine High is normally it's just like, okay, there's the well, go ahead and take care of it. Oh, you don't need me, right? But in this case, it's like, I have 100 questions for you. So I'm going to give you a 30 minute interrogation. And if I like what you're saying, then I'll allow you to go out and sample my water. So, well, Apache, are you sharing? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to paraphrase this a bit. Are you sharing? Um, specifics of the chemicals you're using in the um, drilling and fracking process with CLEAR. They're, they're getting MSDSs for all yes. the chemicals we're using as far as I know. And then we input into frac focus. Um, now I'm not familiar with the system. It's our, our chemical uses for, for, for and, Yeah, I don't know the details of exactly what all Zach and it basically, we have been given all the chemical disclosure that they have access to, and there are some um, proprietary elements, but that's because the chemical um, producers. I think maybe the question is, do you have what you need to get your study done? We have far more information than we've ever had, and uh, yeah, I mean, this okay. is going to be one of our best studies we've ever conducted. Okay. And we bring, in, we bring in Zach and his team to bring a, a level of credibility, and we're looking for truth. We had our own um, baseline study going on with CH2N, um, and it had been going on for a while. Then we collaborated with the UTA. So uh, yeah, we're looking for the truth, and we'll, we'll give him what he needs to be able to, to get to that answer. Um, OK, I'm going to hold, forgive me guys, I'm going to hold a couple of the questions. Some of them are a little more general, and I want to hold them to the end. Um, oh, this is really, OK, uh, this is, is Apache willing to proceed more slowly than usual? given the sensitive nature of the area? I think... How I'm much more running. slowly? <laughs> it, it, slowly, we, we approach things very methodically and scientifically uh, from uh, the unconventional resource team perspective. So, um, but understanding where critical areas are, we've done full analysis of the Alpine High for threatened and endangered species for cultural resources. Uh, we're working very hard to, to get to the uh, to map where the subterranean caverns would reside. Uh, we're looking at, at light impacts, noise impacts, dust impacts, um, a desktop environmental constraints analysis, watershed. So we, we're, we, uh, waters the U.S. We look at many different aspects of the business. I, I feel and, a, oh sorry, finish. And, and then, but yes, we, we approach, maybe not slowly, but methodically, because we know we can't misstep. As I said earlier, um, the eyes are upon us and we have to do it right the first time. Um, it seems like a good transition to Bill Wren. Uh, so Bill, um, ah, I need a mic, sorry. So uh, Bill, the, the idea of, you, Marcus, you talked about you know, lights and the impact of lighting. Um, Bill, you, this, the idea of light pollution affecting the McDonald Observatory, one of the most important observatories in the country, um, isn't new, right? This has been around for, in fact, I think there's a Jennifer Hiller story from like 2010 on it or something like that. Um, <laughs> so uh, tell us, the, kind of give us a quick idea when it first started and 
then where do we stand? You know, have you noticed an increase from uh, Alpine High? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, first off, um, our focus at the observatory is, is very narrow. Our interest is in keeping the skies dark for the cutting edge astronomical research that's ongoing there. It is a world-class research facility. And yeah, about 2010 or so is when we began to see a glow along the north northeastern horizon looking toward the Permian Basin uh, that got our attention. Um, uh, as recently as, uh, well, just a few weeks ago, we measured the sky, did an all-sky photometry measurement, and found that the average background sky has increased over 18% uh, or so above what would be considered a natural background sky. Now that's an all sky average. Almost all of that light pollution, and it, light pollution is a term that I'm hesitant to use because people think I'm gonna chain myself to the nearest lamppost and not let them <laughs> turn, it up, you know, turn it on, but it is a very accurate description, really, of what's going on. If you do on, that, will you post it on Facebook for us? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> but uh, almost all of the light pollution that we're seeing is below 30 degrees above the horizon. It's all down along the horizon. And astronomers are not interested in studying objects through the muck, in the mud, down low, through all that air. The part of the sky we care about is above 30 degrees above the horizon, all the way up to zenith. And that part of the sky we can say is free of light pollution within the margins of air of our but, ability to measure it. But Bill, that would suggest that you're not worried about light pollution, and you are. So well, tell us about we, your fears. I, I, all I'm saying is that there's a difference between saying that uh, the damage has been done and we are, uh, that our ability to do research is impeded now and that there is concern that in the future it could become uh, you know, uh, a hindrance to our ability to do the science. So uh, w w what do you worry about? What could happen well, if the, things aren't taken care of? The, the and for that matter, concern, what do you need to do to take care of it? Sure, the, the, the main concern with the Alpine High play is its proximity to the observatory. It, it's, it's very close, um, it, within 25 air miles or so uh, of the observatory. The, the closer the light source gets, the brighter it will appear. Um, so it, it is uncomfortably close. If we see the level of activity, the same level of activity and the same types of lighting practices and flaring practices that we see, say, in uh, northern Reeves County up near Pecos, Texas, uh, uh, the, if we see that same level of activity down near Balmoray in southern Reeves County that's about 30 miles away, um, then it, we could be in a world of hurt. However, um, I'll reiterate, I'll echo what, what has been said about uh, our relationship with Apache has been very constructive. Uh, at this point, uh, well, um, over the past six, eight months, any time a new drilling rig is brought into the, uh, the region, it doesn't even have to be within the Alpine High Play, but it, even out of the protected area around McDonald Observatory, there are seven counties, by the way, with outdoor lighting ordinances to protect the skies over McDonald Observatory. 28,000 square miles that surrounds the facility is kind of a buffer. Uh, and the Alpine High play is within that, but um, um, we uh, have, any time a new rig has come in, we get an invitation, would you please come and assess our lighting practices? And it's really been a win-win situation. We've been able to show the industry, we've been able to demonstrate that by aiming lights down, the light that was being wasted into the sky and causing light pollution is now down on the work site. There's less glare in rig hands' eyes. They can see that to do their nighttime activities, they can see better, uh, and it's increased safety. So it's really a win-win situation. Okay, quick interruption. Let's pass it to Marcus for some talk of how it's going to do it. But hold that thought for a second. First, um, I'm just curious. I just thought that about this. Is does do oil and gas rigs have to follow the same ordinance in the, that's in those counties in terms of lighting? Are, are they exempted, or is there what's the relationship between the oil and gas rigs and the ordinance that tamps down light. Well, you're asking me? I don't care. Anybody um, wants the answer? I, I, you know, I would, I would say that the counties would probably say they would be exempt because it's temporary. Um, okay. So, so Apache, if Apache follows this, they're doing it on their own behalf. This is not, they don't have to. That's right. Okay. Which, yeah, I, I think that's true. Fair to say. 
Okay, Zach has a question. Yeah, so, um, you talked about Flare as being a common password. Right? You talk about Flare as being a contributing source of light pollution. Is there something that we can put on top of them to limit that? Well, now, I, I know that you guys can speak better to this than I can, but um, the Permian Basin Patrolling Association just two weeks ago released a set of recommended practices for, for lighting in the oil field. And one of the recommendations they made was the use of internal combustors, uh, incinerator cans that go on top of flare stacks so that the flare is concealed, and I believe that it will increase the efficiency of the combustion as well. Uh, however, there's a limit to that, uh, uh, the applicability of that technology. Once you get over, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but about a million cubic meters per day flow rate or so, then the, the combustion chambers are not practical. Um, but um, I know for a fact that Apache has shut in wells during this exploration phase um, when they could, in fact, be getting some oil to market and have a revenue stream now. They have chosen to shut those wells in so they wouldn't have to flare the gas and contribute to the light pollution. So it's been a very productive, very constructive. So the, the, I'm, I'm only guessing that the uh, you know, fall in crude oil prices may have contributed to that decision. No? It, it truly is when it, when it comes to when it comes to uh, where we are again as I say we have to do it right we have to do it right the very first time and so the McDonald observatory is a key piece of, of Texas and it's a key piece of that region we have to do what we can to be as proactive as we possibly can even though the flaring doesn't isn't typically part of the ordinances that you see that doesn't matter. We, we do go out, we do understand that the flaring aspect is temporary, and we talk with, uh, with, with Dr. Ren about these things. We go out, test the well, flow it back, get the data that we need as quickly as we can, and then shut in um, and to try to keep the, uh, obviously we want the revenue, but we want to keep the light down. And then when it comes to the actual fixed lighting um, for, for drilling rigs, um, as, as Dr. Ren said, he comes out, he goes to the other drilling rigs. Before they even enter the Alpine High, he gives us an assessment. And before we go back in, typically he comes back again and gives us, uh, gives us a grade. Uh, and we, we try to, to watch that. So that's when we just bring the rigs in. Now this, does a, this goes across all the departments of our operation. Completions, uh, flow back in, in, in permanent facilities. But we bring in the rigs. And then every week we go through, the HSC team runs through the entire Alpine High and we look at every blasted bulb in the air. And that is the truth. Last week we looked at 612 bulbs. Every, every light plant on completion, every light plant on a flowback, every bulb on a drilling rig, every light plant on a drilling rig. And then as we move into permanent facilities, we'll make sure, as a matter of fact, I sent uh, Dr. Wren some information the other day about our PECUS office that we're building that has some light facilities there. Now, it, it's gonna be a permanent facility, and I believe it's even outside the, the typical radius, but we wanna do it right there too. Uh, and as the, the, like I say, the permanent facilities come in, we'll ask for his advice and, and make sure we have things aimed uh, properly. We don't want to Marcus, what he's got there. Can you talk at all about the um, social license? Just very briefly. I don't know if you. We, have, we didn't. I didn't. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. So forgive me. But social license to operate. The idea that, um, and I've seen this more and more in the industry, that, that that there's a real fear by the industry that if they do things wrong, if they do things in a way that the, the public gets angry enough and about, it could actually harm the company's ability to. But, well, certainly, you know, anytime you have stakeholders, you have to be responsible to them. Uh, we're responsible to ourselves, our communities that we live in, you know, we're West Texas people. Um, but it goes beyond that. We're, we're not doing this out of fear. We're doing it out of uh, wanting to set ourselves apart. Because the Alpine High has set itself apart from the other shale industry, from the other, other fines that we've had. And it's in a, it's in a key area. And so that's really the driver there. We want to show that we can do things differently and do it right, and do it right okay. first. All right, we got two minutes. Um, I want to do two things in those two minutes. First, to, uh, there's, there's one question that wraps up the session really nicely. I want to ask that. And then is there anything any of you want to say that we have not hit yet? Um, actually, you got like 10 seconds, Zach. <laughs> okay, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Well, um, again, as Sabrina pointed out, and we've all touched on, I mean, we certainly don't want to disparage these folks who have these concerns, but it illustrates uh, the, the importance for this to be done properly, for this to be uh, a collaborative, uh, integrative effort uh, to protect the environment because, again, everyone understands that if we compromise the environment for the sake of hydrocarbons, uh, that's not in anyone's best interest. So, like uh, Marcus said, we have to do it right the first time. Okay. So, last question. I think this is in your camp, Apache, but anybody jump in. Um, what is the current status of Apache development in the area now? What will be the point at which development increases substantially? And will the decision be based on the notion that enough of a baseline of data has been established to proceed? We're still in the delineation phases of our development. Uh, so that was the first qu part of your question. How many uh, rigs now? We're, we're in the Alpine House 6. In the Alpine House 6. What's full build out? <laughs> How many rigs when you're completely running? We're, we're running in full delineation mode right now. So you so you will not have more than six ever? I can never say that. No. <laughs> okay. No. What do you think? Is there a, has, have you guys talked about a, a goal of how many rigs you want running? Uh, no, sir. But we're, at, we're right where we want to be right now for the delineation of the play. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding this right. Are you saying that six is what you foresee continuing on? Or do you see a time when you will grow that rig count? For the, for the very near future, six looks like where we will be. You know, it's dependent also on commodity price um, and, and things like this, where there would, there would be an increase. But okay. right now, with the way things are in a, in a very static environment, let's just say, we're where we want to be right now. All right. Anything else, guys? All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.